Wow. <laughs> Amen. Good morning. I would like to uh, welcome everyone here this morning. Um, if you're here for the first time or if you're watching online, I would like just to thank you for being part of our service and the time that worshiping with us here this morning. Um, Isaiah 9, 6 through 7a reads, For us, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace will be no end. So I like to start um, with church life. You got your bulletin here, the gray bulletin. So take the opportunity to read over the bulletin, and there are many opportunities there and needs. So you can remember that. I just like to take the time and highlight a couple of things. Um, remember uh, the pace meal uh, this Monday, and. Uh, so if you're involved in that, don't forget if you signed up. And also pray for those that are attending. Um, it's, a, it's a great opportunity for us to be part of the community and what's happening. So pray for those that are there, that are helping, and the families as well. So you keep that in mind. Um, also, uh, there's prayer pals needed. And if you have any interest in that, see Lisa. That's another reminder. Um, and also, I would like to just remember our brothers and sisters um, who have lost loved ones. Our thoughts and prayers go out to Anna Weinhold and Leon and Lois Zimmerman as they grieve the loss of um, their sister. Um, also pray for Emily and Jim. Our prayers and thoughts go out to you for the loss of your dad. And also for Jerry and Jean, the unexpected passing of Jerry's brother. So our thoughts and prayers go out to you guys. So at this time, uh, let's have our focus verse. If we can stand. All right, Luke 2.10. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. For I bring you good news that would cause great joy for all the people. Luke 2.10. At this time, you can be seated. So this time, we're going to bring the offering front. Uh, just a reminder that our offering project is for uh, raising money for pigs. Um, and uh, our goal is to raise enough money for 45 pigs. Thank you. And let's see here. So we have raised, as of now, $512, enough for 16 pigs. Wow, that's cool. So at this time, we're going to watch a quick video of the MCC project. Thank you guys. Um, yeah, just a reminder, so every time we raise $32 for a pig, we'll be being put a pig on the tree. Um, so at this time, let's pray. Dear Lord, I just thank you for today. I thank you for the willingness hearts of each one here as we give. Um, we think of this project of people that aren't as blessed as we are, 
And so we want to try to bless them. So we just lift this offering up to you that it may reach those in places that aren't as fortunate as we are, but they can have something that can sustain them. Um, so just prepare our hearts as we give back to those. And I just thank you for everything you have blessed us with. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So as we come to a time, hmm, I forgot something. <laughs> hey, Macy, Molly, can you grab that globe for me real quick? Anyways, as we come to a time of worship, I guess this is imprompt. Wow. So Revelation 7-9 reads this. After this, I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne. And in front of the Lamb, they were wearing white robes, and were holding palm branches in their hands. So I was just reminded how big God's church is. We just read here that someday every nation and every tribe and every language is going to be standing in front of the throne. And I'm also reminded how big our world is, and yet how small it is. So real quick, I'd like to take the time. It really impressed on me recently. I live right here. And this summer, my wife and Lena had the opportunity to fly the whole way across to a little place in Kenya, right here. And had an awesome opportunity that God has blessed them with. And then recently, I had the opportunity to fly from my little point right here, sometimes I get stuck into, but fly the whole way across the United States to Chico, California to spend time with my daughter. And while I was there, I believe we are called to be intentional. And I was impressed that how many different people from all over the world were right there. And it gave me the opportunity to hear their stories. We've learned of a gentleman that was from Kenya was there. So me and Janelle took the time to meet with him for lunch, and we started asking him questions. Four hours later, we're still having a conversation. So I was just blessed um, listening to him and his story and his life, and I could go on and on. But yet, I couldn't help to think the purpose that God has designed, that earlier that year, Janelle was the whole way over here, and when I had the opportunity to fly to here, and people from all over the world came together for one purpose, and to serve God and praise God. So um, I'm just amazed how God is moving in our midst, and I think we need to be intentional. And uh, I've just been blessed by that, and just, I find it ironic how that all came together when we're from all around. And I'd like to finish by saying, uh, verse 10 then goes on to say that, and they cried out in a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. So as we come and praise our Lord and Savior, what a wonderful, amazing God that we serve, that we all can come together. So let's do it in a loud voice. you to stand as we come to our time of worship. We'll be singing Christmas songs and hymns in the first line you'll find in the Mennonite hymnal. If you like the hymnal number 111, there are five verses, but we'll only sing one through four. O come, O come, Emmanuel. <coughs> Come, oh, call me. 
Thank you for leading us in that time of uh, praise and worship. What a great song. Let's just come before the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for all that you've done. Father, this time of the year, this season uh, that we, we remember and we anticipate the, the coming birth of you, and, but also so much more, what you, what you came to do and um, the things that you have for us yet. Father, may we always remember that you are worthy of praise. You are worthy of praise all of our lives. We can't give you enough praise because we're unable to. But Lord, you, in, you, you desire everything that we do offer to you. And so Lord, may you just be with us here this morning um, with those who are grieving, but with each one of us, no matter what, 
what our experience and journey is, Lord, you love us and you care for us. And you invite us into something much bigger than ourselves. Lord, may you uh, give me wisdom as I open up your word here this morning and talk about peace. May your, you be filled, um, fill me up and, and fill each one of us as we go out ahead of this week. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it is good to be together again. I think I say that every time, but it really is good to be together. Um, just to, to be in the presence and fellowship with fellow believers and those who are walking this journey of life in obedience with our Heavenly Father. It really is a joy for me, and I trust it is for you as well. Well, this is the second Sunday of Advent, um, and the theme for the second Sunday is typically peace. And so we're going to talk about peace today. Um, maybe do a bit of a word study on the word peace. As Jeff mentioned last week, the word Advent means an expectant waiting or a hope-filled anticipation, looking forward to something uh, that is not yet here. And so it's it's appropriate ahead of the birthday of Christ, the day we celebrate Christmas, to anticipate and to expect, just like they did, uh, just like Mary and her husband Joseph were expecting this baby, we today can reflect back and expect and anticipate all the things that Jesus came to do for us. Um, Yes, in many ways they did not fully understand, in most ways they did not fully understand what was coming with Jesus, and yet they they were excited. They reflected on the prophecies and all the things that God had shared through the prophets up to that time, and they were anticipating this, this coming Messiah, yet not really at all are fully understanding what it meant for them. And so today, we know what Jesus came to do. Um, do we fully live out everything he wants us to? Probably not. I know I, I come up short. And yet, we're expecting so much more. The hope and the, and the anticipation of the fulfillment of his kingdom is before us yet. And we don't know what that's going to all look like. And yet, he's given us glimpses and, and things that put hope in us. And so we're going to talk about that today. The title of my sermon is, Peace on earth. And I'm going to be reading from Luke chapter 2, um, verse 8 through 20. Um, and this is right in the middle of Luke's account of Jesus' birth. Um, as a matter of fact, verse 7 is when it declares that Jesus was born in Bethlehem. Uh, this is, so we're kind of in a piece here, but there's really something I'd like to, to latch onto or pull out here of what the angel shared to the shepherds. Um, This, just for reference in the timeline of God's story, this is approximately 700 to 750 years after Isaiah prophesied about the coming of the the Messiah in the form of a child. This is about 400 years, or 450 years maybe, since God has last spoken through or called any new prophets to share words of wisdom, words directly from God. And so there's a a large period of time here prior to the birth of Christ where there wasn't a whole lot of new information given. And you think 400 years, I look at the, I I always refer to the age of our nation here in the United States, and I don't know exactly how old we are. I should know this off the top of my hand, but we're in that same ballpark. So you think about the amount of time that has passed, that's a lot of time to not hear anything from God, anything new. And so we reflect on that and it's like, I think I could have forgotten. And if we don't pass things on to the next generation well, you can understand why it may have been hard and the things that people were looking for at the coming of of this Messiah might have been, it's understandable how things got confused and mixed up. That's a lot of time. Well, anyhow, So this is right after Jesus was born, and uh, God sends his messengers to the shepherds in the field. I'm going to start reading in verse 8 of chapter 2 in Luke. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news. That will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. And I would just like to pause there. God could not have spoken any clearer to that day and age 
of who Jesus was. And it just dawned on me this morning as I was rereading over this, how many people kept asking, are you the Messiah? Are you the Messiah? Jesus sent his messengers directly from the heavens to declare to the hometown in David, Bethlehem, the people Jesus grew up around and said, he is the Messiah, the Lord. He couldn't have spoken any clearer. Anyhow, that's not where, even where we're going this morning, but I just found that fascinating. He said, he is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth, peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angel had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see the, this thing that the Lord, that which has happened and the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for the things that they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. Well, this is a story that probably most of us have read and heard for years. And it's one of those stories that I think we can just pass by, not pass by, it's there, but to really grasp what was happening, it was out of this world, supernatural, what God was doing. And he made it very clear by sending these angelic messengers down to the earth um, in, in ways that he hadn't spoken for years, hadn't spoken, but this was even new. And it began with the, with the angels coming to Mary and Joseph, but now it was a proclamation of the world to the world um, in the form of the shepherds. He was, he was pronouncing this big event in a very amazing way. Well, what really struck me in this uh, and what I'd like to focus on is the, the words of these messengers that God sent, these angels. They were given a clear word of what to share. And so this comes in verse, in, uh, verse 14. After the multitude of the heavenly host appeared, they say, glory to God in the highest heaven. First and foremost, they are praising Yahweh, creator God, for his unfolding of this plan. And they're declaring this in the highest heaven. They're declaring God above all. And that's exactly who he was. So they're praising God. But then they, they meant had this phrase, and on earth, peace to those on whom his favor rests. And so they're declaring peace on the earth, where, where we as human beings lived, and where Mary and Joseph and all those who were living it that day were, were dwelling. And so not only were they talking about what was happening in the heavenly realm, they're saying peace. They're declaring peace over earth. And I asked the question, what was meant? by this declaration of peace. You can reflect on it, and if you look very quickly over the life of Jesus, and even in the days and the years to follow this, it clearly did not bring peace to everyone. Within a couple years, he was already being hunted for to be killed because of the prophecy of this coming king that became a threat to Herod. And so this did not like, just initiate a blanket peace to the world, as we might think of. Well, let's do a little bit of a word study, as I mentioned, on what peace means and where it comes from in the context of how God brought this through his scripture, but also how the people of that time would have understood peace. In the New Testament, uh, the New Testament is written in Greek, and so the word uh, for peace that is translated uh, where peace is translated from, is erene. Um, this is mentioned some 90 times or 90 plus times throughout the New Testament. Uh, this is the same word um, in the Hebrew, in the Old Testament, that is translated from shalom. Um, and this is mentioned 190 plus times in the Old Testament. So this idea of peace, uh, the way 
our scriptures are interpreted today is used throughout the whole Bible um, in a very profound theme that God carried from the day of creation. And most, almost every time it is translated to peace, our English word of peace. Uh, and if you look up in the dictionary, I was fascinated. Um, there's about six or seven different definitions, depending on the dictionary you would go to, that are used to describe peace, which I found fascinating that if you would combine all of them, it fits almost what, what shalom would have meant in the Old Testament. I'm going to use shalom because we're probably more familiar with that than irene. Um, it just has a lot more meaning. So, Not that it's any different, but that's the word I'm going to use and reference. And so, of all those definitions, probably the one at the top of the list, or the most common one, is that we think of in reference is the absence of conflict or the absence of war. When we think of peace, we think of the absence of those negative things. And that is true. However, shalom means so much more. The definition that we find and what's understood through Scripture is so much deeper and so much more profound. You cannot capture it, or capture it all by the word peace. <laughs> And the definite, that's why there's so many definitions in our dictionary. Um, we don't know how to describe it because it's so full. But we do the term peace in the Bible, as used here, when the angel said peace on earth, or on earth peace, we do that term a misjustice when we think of it as terms of the absence of war. That's not what the angels were declaring over us. And so, the definition of shalom, if we look at the context real quickly here, goes back to the Garden of Eden. What God created in the Garden of Eden, the perfection before sin entered the world, that's shalom. Where all creation, everything lived in harmony. The animals, the human beings, the relationship with God, the relationship between the human beings, it was all perfect. Kind of a utopia, if you will another word that would fit into there. That's the concept of shalom when we look, think of it as a noun. Or in Scripture, it's used at times as being a wall or a building, a structure that was completed. It was shalomed. Or I think Abraham once used the word shalom or peace in saying his, his, uh, his sheepfold or his pen was complete. It was shalom because everything was there. All the animals were in it. And so, shalom has this sense of being a co completeness or fullness. But it's also much more. And talking about relationships, it's having all relationships in perfect harmony, where there is no, no conflict. Everybody's hearing and communicating well, and, and there's peace. And so, in relationships, that's another way we think of the word shalom. When you think about in a family setting where all relationships, there's peace and there's shalom in that setting, that's a good thing. But then you start adding multiple layers and multiple families working together, creating large communities, and all of this working together, support and help each other and live for each other, that's a community in shalom. And that's God's perfect intent. That's the description of that God comes from, that God is coming from when we think about shalom. A perfect unity. If you use the word shalom in peace, or the, shalom, the word shalom as a verb, we talk about bringing shalom. And this is, this is the process of making complete. So in other words, if you're building a building, when you put the last piece of that on, whatever it might be, maybe the last brick or the last shingle, you've, you've, you've shalomed it. You've, you've made it complete or finished. When you think about relationships, completing or fulfilling a relationship with somebody else is reconciliation. Bringing them around to the place uh, of working together and being healthy again. Um, this is not, we talked about the term, it is not being at war. But you can have two people not at war who are not speaking, not talking, and not seeing eye to eye, and they are far from at peace. They are far from shalom. And so, yes, there is no war. There is no battle there. But there is also not shalom. And so shalom is the process and the intentionality of working at building that up and making that relationships right, which means being humble. 
each person owning their part, their mistakes, and asking for forgiveness, and laying that down humbly before the Lord, and before the person who was made hurt, and then using whatever we have to work together in life. Remember God's call for ruling together. That's the picture we get of working together to provide food, shelter, um, you name it. All the things that make society function well. That's, the, that's using shalom as a verb, as in, in other words, bringing shalom to, uh, to a community or to a situation. This is what God, through his moral law that he laid out to Moses, this is what the law was intended to do. If you look at all the laws that were about right relationships and things you do if your oxen ran across a whole bunch of other people's crops, there was laws to make you go and, and fix that. But not only fix it, make it right. Like add the, uh, give them whatever it was damaged. But there's this working together to make it right. Not just saying, oh, I won't, I'll pen my animal up and leave, leave it go. And hopefully it doesn't happen again. No, it's making it right. Taking care of the damage that was caused. This is what God's desire was. And again, reflecting back to the Garden of Eden, where things just worked perfectly together. That's the concept of shalom. Obviously, this never happened. Because we live since the day of, of sin, since the fall in, in the garden, we, we can't live this out perfectly. Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 and 7, Kevin already read this this morning, but I'm going to read it again as he reflects on what God laid on his heart about the coming Messiah and what this coming Messiah was going to do. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, he says, For to us a child is born, and to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. He will be over all the government. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Prince of Shalom. He's the prince. He's the, the head of all this working together. That has a whole different context to Prince of Peace, doesn't it? Over the greatness of his kingdom, of his government, and Shalom, there will be no end. There will be no end to it. And so then I bring us back to this, this phrase that uh, is shared by the angels, God's messengers at the birth of Christ, when they're saying, on earth, peace. And yet well, we can clearly see that this peace didn't material. It wasn't like this amazing atmosphere where everything worked together perfectly, was it? So what, what was meant by this declaration of peace? Well, I will challenge you to think about the second part of that phrase, where the angel said, peace on earth to whom God's favor rests, or who his favor rests. There's a lot in that. And we could go down a bunch of theological paths here that we could name uh, men who have theologies in the past, and, and there's, there's groups of people who say, well, this, is, this means we've never had a choice. God has chosen everyone from the beginning. And I don't think that's accurate. God has always given us a choice. And yet God, in his infinite, infinite wisdom, already knows who is going to choose what. So we're not going to go down that path. But I would challenge you to think, in this story, in the birth of Christ, in the years to follow, Who were the people who experienced peace? Was it not those who believed and took the message to heart? So on whom his favor rests are those who have heard and recognized what God was up to and believed in their heart. Whether they understood it completely, they chose to move on in faith and with a foundation of faith. 
that what was said is going to be true. And in, in itself, it brings around this, this, uh, this feeling of peace, of comfort, peace and comfort. But it doesn't naturally mean that shalom, the bigger picture of peace, is lived out, does it? So the coming of Christ, the coming of Jesus, did not take away our choice, or everything would have turned out to be amazing. But what Jesus, in other words, brought was a sense of grace and forgiveness. That each one of us, in our failures, our sins, our mistakes, we can recognize that God, through His Son Jesus, has has provided, provided a way for us to move on for reconciliation, for redemption, to put that in our past, but invite us and invite us into a new way of life, a different way, which looks like shalom. And you can go through Scripture. Jesus teaching um, in Matthew 5, chapter 9, uh, this is, there's a ton of references, and I can't read all of them, but Matthew chapter 5, verse 9, is in his Sermon on the Mount, in uh, what we call the Beatitudes. He says, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Or in other words, blessed are those who intentionally decide to promote shalom. This lifestyle, making choices that are going to bring people together, which means at times, humbling ourselves when we make mistakes, seeking reconciliation, and asking for forgiveness. Because that's what, happen, what's, that's what needs to happen for shalom to be promoted. He says, blessed are the shalom makers, if you will, for they will be called children of God. John, in his, uh, his letter or his epistle from John chapter 14, verse 27, he says, this is words of Jesus. Jesus says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. And so we can plug shalom in there. Shalom, I leave with you. So he's leaving this presence, this this ability to create shalom, to live shalom out. And he says, my shalom I give you. This is a direct reference of Jesus imparting on us the Holy Spirit. God has put in each and every person the desire for shalom. It's there. As imperfect as it may be or as incomplete as it may be, it may be it's there. For instance, we all desire to see things work together. This past week, I'll share a couple stories from just this past week. I, was, uh, I live on a farm and I, have, I raise cattle and I have some pigs and... Um, Occasionally, you have to clean the pens out. And to clean my, my pig pen out, I have to move some cattle out of a pen and pen them up and then run the pigs over into that pen and clean it out. It's kind of a process. I was in the middle of running the pigs over to my other pen, which kind of puts me in the back of the barn, and I heard a crash up towards the front of the barn. I thought, I don't know what that, I'm not familiar with that sound. It was kind of unique. And didn't think much of it. I was in the process of doing my job and as cute as pigs may be, they are kind of frustrating to move around at times. Um, anyhow, I step out from where I was at and look out through one of the, the pens in the barn, and I'm seeing steers going across this doorway. I'm like, that's not any longer in the barn. That's escaped. And I'm like, that's not good. And so the absence of peace has now taken over me, <laughs> if you will. And so I like immediately think, I need to fix this. I need to do something here. And so I started call, trying to calm myself down, thinking I don't want to disturb them or alert them and get them running or chasing. Well, my dog had that covered. He took care of getting them worked up. But I, I managed to get up and, and get most of them turned around and back in the barn. And one of them made it the whole way out where I, and he was out, and he was just, enjoying his newfound freedom, frolicking around and pesting my dog. My dog was pesting him. And so I'm like, okay, I, I got to get... The gate was... What happened was the dog was pestering the steers at the gate, and the steers stuck their head through the gate, and 
then backed up, and the gate wasn't latched because I had just gone through it, and they pulled the gate open and then got excited and lifted it off the hinge pins, which I didn't even know was possible. I have blocks there that's supposed to keep that from happening so that they don't do that, and well, they figured out how to get it off. And uh, so the gate was now off, and I had no way of keeping the other steers from exiting the barn. And so uh, this is getting to be a long story. I ended up getting all the other steers penned up and stepped out of the way to go figure out how to get the steer, and he walked right back in the barn. And I hung the gate back up, and, I, and peace <laughs> was restored. We have a desire for peace. When things aren't right, there's something that kicks in us and says, this isn't right, we need to fix this. Another instance this week, maybe a, a bit different, because this involves family and relationship. When things aren't right, God has put in us to know that this isn't right. When people aren't interacting well. And what one of my, one of my, God has given me that ability, like I believe he has each one of you. But I can, in, in my being a strength that I can see when things aren't right, he is also, there's a weakness to that. And how we, how we deal with that um, can come out in not so great ways. And so my frustration built as, as things kind of unraveled maybe in our house, and I became angry and did and said some things I should not have. Because of what I already had seen was not right. And in a moment, when I f- you think, like, this isn't right, i got to do things, we get all caught up in our emotions and our instincts, something just comes out of us. Because when we're, when we're angry, we're out of a place that's, that's a place where God can work through us in a healthy way. What's human comes out of us. And I made some mistakes. But that doesn't change the fact that God puts in us what we... My point is that God puts in us when things to see what's not right. And so I had to take the steps I just described. I had to apologize. I had to make things right. Because I very quickly realized I now became part of the problem. And I had to own my part. My desire and passion for peace and for shalom was so great that I lost control of who I was, and I did and said some things that actually just exasperated the problem. God puts in us this desire for things to be right, but there is a right and a wrong way to go about it. Shalom is taking the appropriate steps at the appropriate times. And it is in us and through us that the Holy Spirit Get what God has put in us, that we were able to do that. And so what I should have done is pull myself away, calm down to where I can hear the Spirit of God speaking into me and taking the right steps. Wow, so where does that take us here? God has put this desire in us for shalom, for peace. And that happened because of Jesus Christ. It didn't happen right at his birth, but it was what the angel was declaring. This peace on earth. Through Jesus, we were going to receive the ability to promote shalom. But it still was a choice, right? It wasn't automatic. We still have the choice to make. And I think Jeff ended up the same place with last week with hope and, and joy and comfort. We can declare joy and comfort to the world, but if we aren't offering it, if we aren't taking the steps to bring that into fruition or to see that it happens, does joy and comfort really happen? No. We are the instruments. We are the vessels. We are the people. We are the part of God's kingdom here on this earth that God is saying, he's inviting us to these things. He's inviting us to be people of peace, people of shalom. Jesus brought 
Jesus' birth brought shalom to that day. Did they fully understand it? No. Do we fully understand it today? No. But it's evident by those who believed him and lived out what he said and what he did. And it's evident by what they experienced and how they demonstrated and walked their lives. That it is possible to be in shalom, to live in shalom and be at peace. And so the same is true for us today. In the advent of peace, in the ex- in expectant, I'm not getting my words right, expecting peace, as we think about the coming of Christ's birth, what it meant for them 2,000 some years ago, it means the same thing for us, doesn't it? There's something coming, there's something that has happened that we can look forward to that brings us peace. We are very, very familiar with the things around us in this world today that aren't right. You don't have to look at the news very far. You don't even have to step out of our own towns, maybe even our neighborhoods, to see that there are things around us that aren't right. There's an absence of shalom. And as I shared in my story, it's our attitudes and the way we deal with that that sets an example of whether we are either exasperating it, being part of the lack of peace, or if we're actually living out how to bring it to something better. You and I aren't going to solve world peace on a big front. And so getting angry about it and frustrated, that, that, doesn't, that doesn't do anything. Other than in our own communities, it sets an example. It's like, hmm, is that helping? It doesn't, set, it doesn't make us look good in our own settings. But what does, and what catches people's attention, is when we make efforts to put pigs in people's lives, if you will. That's just a, an example. That's a physical example of it. But the concept is there of going the extra mile, taking the extra step to intentionally bring about shalom or bring about peace in people's lives. And when we do that, we catch the attention of people because we're meeting their needs. We're speaking a language that everybody deep within us knows this is something that's right. This, this, this will work. And so it catches people's attention because it's not living for self. It's not putting ourselves above other people. But it's seeing everybody around us in the same light. The other thing is, Jesus, Jesus is coming again. He's made that very clear to us. And so we are expectantly awaiting the second coming of Christ. When, as Daniel says, this big rock is going to come down, it's going to crush the kingdoms of the world. And he's going to set this rock up and it's going to become an amazing mountain and it's going to reign. It's going to be the rule of Christ himself. And all wrong is going to be made right. We're waiting for that. And the more that I see that's wrong in the world, the more I'm like, boy, that day is just going to be amazing. Why I challenge you as you reflect on peace, reflect on this message that this angel shared, this declaration of peace on earth. How are you being part? of promoting peace, promoting shalom. In this time frame, in this time that we are living in, where God has put in us the ability to bring it about, in our communities, in the spheres, in in the atmospheres, in the places where we are living. He hasn't asked us to solve world peace. He has the solution to that coming. But he's asked us to be a light, to share the good news of the gospel of the Messiah. Through our actions, Are you bringing peace on earth? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much.
what you have done. Lord, you have intended so much more than than we can imagine or understand and fathom. And Lord, you love us. You've invited us. You've forgiven us. You've made a way for us to be at peace with you. You've reconciled us to, uh, to you. Lord, may we understand more fully today what you, you desire from us as a people to live in peace, to be instruments of it, to intentionally seek out the things around us and the situations that will bring about shalom. As best as we can, Father, may you, may you give us wisdom in, in when to... Uh, when to live these things out and how to do that, Lord. As I shared, our emotions get in the way, Lord, and we, our humanness takes over and that gives us opportunities to continue to live out shalom. But Lord, may our hearts be in tune with you, be in tune with your spirit to continue to do this wherever it is that you lead us. If it's right here in our community, but also if you're you're leading and tapping some of us on on our shoulders and asking us to go to other places around the world is... As Kevin mentioned, your kingdom, your church is global. Lord, lead us to the places and the situations and the circumstances that need shalom. And may we see it for what it is and experience your power and humbly walk in whatever path it is that you have for us to get there. I close with the phrase of the angels. Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand for our closing song. It's to us a child of hope is born. Mennonite hymnal number 125. us a child of hope is born, to us a son is given, him shall the tribes of earth obey, him all the host of heaven, him shall the tribes of earth obey, him all the host of heaven, his name shall be to God in the highest and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rest. As David shared that, I too must say when he read that, to men whom his favor rest just popped out to me. And I just loved how you shared that, the examples you've given. What an awesome lesson for us. Thank you, David. Um, It reminded me of the importance of peace, shalom the importance of what that is, so we can have his favor. Christ has come. This is the story of Jesus Christ has come. He has come. And we need to have Christ as the center of everything in our life. Peace has come. For the benediction, um, I would like to read Philippians 4, 7. And may the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts, your minds, and Christ Jesus. Go in peace.
Thank you.